The news now on BBC One with Hugh Edwards and Assad Ahmed. By a whisker, the Prime Minister survives the crucial vote on university tuition fees. The eyes to the right, 316. The nose to the left, 311. <laughs> Mr Blair's majority cut to just five. It's the biggest revolt on domestic policy since Labour came to power. We'll be assessing the political damage as the bill's opponents promise that the fight isn't over yet. Also tonight, on the eve of the Hatton Report, the Sun newspaper claims it has the conclusions. No animal testing centre in Cambridge. Scientists worry about security threats. And the easy favourite to triumph at the Oscars, the first install, final instalment of Lord of the Rings. And in BBC London news, streets, fines and videotape, a speed camera for every road in the capital. And tune in to Wandsworth Jail as the country's first prison radio takes to the airwaves. Good evening. Tony Blair's solid parliamentary majority was reduced to just five tonight when MPs voted on his plans for higher university fees in England. It's the biggest rebellion Mr Blair has suffered on domestic policy since he came to power. Opponents of the bill promised that the battle would continue in the months to come. The vote took place earlier this evening after days of hard bargaining and cajoling in which the Prime Minister was heavily involved. When the result came, 316 MPs had voted for the second reading of the bill and 311 had walked through the no lobby to register their opposition. The government's usually massive majority was cut to just five. 72 Labour MPs had snubbed Mr Blair's appeals for support and a further 19 Labour MPs decided not to vote at all. So let's join our chief political correspondent, Mark Mardell, at Westminster. Mark. Skin of the teeth, seat of the pants, whatever you want to call it, the government came perilously close to losing tonight, despite, as you say, its massive majority, the biggest domestic rebellion, because Iraq was a bigger rebellion, against Tony Blair since he came to power. And it's a real reminder that many, many of his MPs just are disgusted and dislike the policies which he regards as absolutely central to modernising and changing Britain. As MPs filed through the lobbies, the government thought it had lost by two votes, despite another day of cajoling and exhortation by the Prime Minister, the Chancellor and the Deputy Prime Minister. So this was relief of a sort. The eyes to the right, 316. The nose to the left, 311. <laughs> But to fight this hard, this long, for a majority of five is scarcely a ringing endorsement. The eyes have it. Unlocked. We didn't lose it, as we might have done. Had we lost it, it would have been a serious blow to our authority. Uh, as it is, we have the ability to take the legislation forward, and so that's what we'll do. How much damage has been done to the government in the process? Well, there's always a bit of damage when there's uh, divisions on any particular matter. But this is a very serious reform. It's an important reform, and it's not surprising that people have been concerned about various aspects of it. As MPs filtered out to the waiting cameras, the rebels were pleased they'd held so firm under such pressure, disappointed with the result. One of their leaders has this message for the Prime Minister. Uh, if you thought it was going to bring you down, that was wrong. That's not what it's about. The message was it's an unpopular policy, and uh, we need to change some of the elements of it to make it popular. If you take variable out, you've got the vote. Another rebel considered the implications. It's the worst result for these students, the worst result for universities that won't get the funding that they need, and a terrible result for the government, which is very badly crippled by this. It simply couldn't be worse. Her vote helped make the difference between victory and defeat. Angela Eagle changed her mind today and voted with the government. I decided last night that I couldn't abstain on an issue that's important, and I decided finally this morning after I'd spoken both to the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State about the precise nature of the concessions which limit variability. The day's high drama began when the ex-chief whip and rebel leader suddenly unexpectedly switched sides to the boos of students and cries of sellout and traitor. One of the mysteries of the day, why he changed. Mr Brown says a promised review in a year's time of the impact on working-class students did the trick, not an instruction from his chum the Chancellor. 
look, I, I, I'm tremendous friends with Gordon, and we've had tremendous arguments about all this, but I'm, going, I'm a backbench MP, and I'm going to do what I believe to be right on the merits of the case, and I'm not going to be pushed about by anyone. But while Downing Street insisted this was no concession, there was no new money, Mr Brown suggested that a promise from the Chancellor had saved the day. I have to say to the Secretary of State, he is probably the only Secretary of State now to have that nod and a wink from the Treasury uh, uh, pertaining to the uh, spending <laughs> review. And if I... No one else in government seemed aware of this deal, uh, a point Mr. a former Mr. Conservative Mr. leader picked up on. It is... Not unusual, of course, for a minister to make concessions when he has said he will not make concessions. That is part of the normal negotiating process of politics. It is quite unusual for a minister to make concessions he did not wish to make, and it is wholly extraordinary to make concessions he was not aware that he was making. Concession or not, it did work. But now the opposition parties are aiming their fire at Tony Blair. It's a huge setback for Tony Blair personally, and it shows that he can't carry his own party in the direction he wants to. I think his government is now in terminal decline. Well, I think, I think Tony Blair staked his reputation and, in fact, delivering a Thatcherite revolution within the Labour Party in terms of public services. And I think that what this does is to say that his backbenchers do not support that uh, revolution. Indeed, those MPs who rebelled and many who did not say this battle isn't over. Some hope they can still get rid of the idea of different universities charging different fees when the next vote comes around. Now, Tony Blair's friends say this narrow squeak tonight pro proves that he has the guts, the courage, to drive through reforms which he really believes are essential. But there are other, others in the Cabinet who spent a lot of time on this who think it's just a nerve-wracking, nail-biting way to do business, and they're saying it mustn't happen again. Mark, thank you very much. And as uh, Mark was saying there, such a narrow win for ministers on a key policy does raise inevitable questions about Mr Blair's authority and his chances of securing other contentious pieces of legislation. The Prime Minister is keen to push through further reform of the public services. Laura Trevelyan assesses his prospects in the coming months. The biggest revolt by far against Tony Blair as Prime Minister. How did the government's massive majority shrink to just five? After the brinkmanship and the high drama, now comes the sober reflection. There must be better ways to run a government. It's always a difficulty when you get big majorities, but the point is true, 160-odd majority, and we're scrabbling around to get enough for this policy. I think a lot of mistakes perhaps would be made, a lot of lessons to be learned. Fight, fight, we will fight! Education is the right! For these students, the lesson is just a handful more rebel MPs and tuition fees would have sunk without trace. For Labour MPs, the lesson is rather different. We cannot go on being treated this way by the uh, Prime Minister and the Cabinet. We just can't. We are grown-up politicians. He puts something in a manifesto and he expects us to stand on our head to, uh, when he wants to push this legislation through. Here in Pendle in Lancashire, Labour Party members are delighted their government won, but they too want to see a change in style. If anything, the leadership should start to listen just a little bit more careful to what the people are saying and not just going heavy-handed. I think Mr Blair needs to take lo wider and longer soundings. I think perhaps take a longer lead-up into a bill like this, which is controversial. After all of this, on Thursday, Tony Blair is making a speech on, of all things, the public service reform agenda. But after this battle royal to get tuition fees through Parliament with a majority of only five, where is his public service reform agenda now? Yes, there have to be adjustments, admits this leading Blairite. A win is a win. However, it is important that lessons are learned from this. And the most important lessons are debate the reforms before they're launched and secondly, make sure that it isn't reform for reform's sake, that it is reform for a purpose. This particular reform was one the Prime Minister and the Chancellor united behind. So where's the power balance now in that relationship? It's easy to think that the balance of power has shifted dramatically towards Gordon Brown because he's the one who's had to rescue Tony Blair. But the narrowness of the victory suggests that Gordon Brown may not be as powerful inside Labour as some people think. Mr Blair and Mr Brown know their authority won't survive many more knife-edge votes. Laura Trevelyan, BBC News, Westminster. Well, to Downing Street now and our political editor, Andrew Marr. Andrew, what are the lessons, uh, if any, that the Prime Minister is prepared to draw from uh, this experience? 
Well, I think there's an awful lot of senior Labour Party people who say that the main lesson is that he's got to stop doing politics this way. I mean, if you can imagine a different way of dealing with the university problem, if 18 months ago he'd stood up and said, look, there is a big issue here, a big problem the country faces with funding universities. We need a national debate. Here are the different options for doing it. And above all, if he'd put that to the Labour Party, then he'd have come up with a range of solutions and we wouldn't have had this desperate scrambling around. But Tony Blair's style has always been to have a small group of advisors or gurus or call them what you will um, and to have them in and to have some wheeze which he then tries to bounce the Labour Party into accepting. And I think although he has got enormous strengths in terms of his ability to charm and argue and win people personally. I mean, he came, you know, he came this close. He came five fingers away from destruction. And I think that style has proved to be a failure. Um, no government with this kind of majority should be this close to catastrophe. We've heard a lot in recent days, Andrew, about the balance of power and how it might change. That mm. is to say, between Mr Blair and his next-door neighbour there in Downing Street, Mr Brown, um, not least because of the way the various camps have been behaving. What do you make of that? <laughs> well, there's a change. Um, there's been an awful lot of uh, tetchy and difficult and mutually suspicious briefing uh, from both sides today. That's the Brownites and the, and the Blairites, as it were. In the end, there's absolutely no doubt that the Chancellor's involvement in trying to bring Nick Brown and a handful of others around today was terribly important because in the end the vote was a matter of a handful of people switching sides. So the Chancellor was influential. The Chancellor has offered a little bit more, a tiny extra concession which had some effect. Probably the lesson for both Tony Blair and Gordon Brown is that needed the two of them to win this vote. Andrew in Downing Street, thank you. Well, student leaders have expressed their disappointment at the result, but they warned that the bill had a long way to go, that the parliamentary battle was far from over. Let's join our special correspondent, Gavin Hewitt, who's at the University of East Anglia, which, by the way, is in the constituency of the Education Secretary, Charles Clark. Over to you, Gavin. Well, I've had a real sense tonight of a university divided. There are some who believe they've been thrown a lifeline, that this is one small step towards solving university funding. But there are others here tonight sitting with their heads in their hands, feeling angry and betrayed. Student faces, intense, concerned, awaiting the result from Westminster in a packed council chamber tonight. 16. The noise to the left... Oh. When they heard the government had won, they just sat there silently. But many felt university as a result had become a less attractive place. No one's going to focus on what's going to happen to the students who are coming here in a couple of years' time who are going to leave university with £20,000, £25,000 worth of debt. And that's the real tragedy of this vote. Even though the government had made concessions, particularly for students from lower income families, it cut little ice here. I'm absolutely appalled. I, had, I really thought the rebels have the courage of their convictions. I'm gutted, especially as the vote's so close. I think it's just a terrible shame. But the result was welcomed by those who run the university, who see it as a first step towards solving the funding crisis. Uh, I think what we see tonight is the start of a new era for higher education. It's the end of some 20 years of underfunding of teaching in universities. Out in the community, it's large student debt that troubles people most. Even so, some in Norwich tonight were supporting top-up fees. Nothing's free in this life. They've got to go and earn their crust. We've all had to do it. But at the local sports centre, it was also easy to detect that Tony Blair's victory had been won at a cost. Tony Blair's standing has been a bit damaged because... Um, Really, he's broken the manifesto promise, where well, they promised not to do this. And uh, so I think it probably has come out a bit badly. There are some gains in all of this for future students. Upfront fees will be eliminated, and a real effort will be made to recruit students from the poorest backgrounds. But what no one knows is how many others from middle income families will be put off by the fear of large debts. 
So this is an issue far from settled. Even though universities like this will get more money, nobody here pretends it's going to get anywhere close towards solving the funding crisis. And as someone put it to me here this evening, sooner or later, the vice chancellors are going to go back to the government, knock on their door, and ask for those top-up fees to be increased. This is an argument set to run and run. Hugh? Gavin, thank you. Well, at the heart of the debate, of course, is the likely effect of higher fees on students and their families. We heard some of the views there. Set against the financial needs of the universities themselves. Our education correspondent, Mike Baker, has this assessment. So, now the vote is over and the concessions pocketed by the rebels, what's the final package for students? Well, new students starting in 2006 will have the current upfront fees of just over £1,000 scrapped. Instead, they will face deferred fees of anything up to £3,000 a year, payable after graduation. For most three-year courses, that means £9,000 fees debt. On top of loans for living costs, that could make total debts of around £20,000. But loan repayments don't kick in until students are earning £15,000 a year. The concessions mean the poorer students will get up to £3,000 a year in government grants and university bursaries. Any debts they haven't paid off after 25 years will be written off. And there'll be no fee increase beyond inflation until 2010. These changes weren't enough to win over Julia Prague, the medical student who'd earlier tackled Tony Blair over the high cost of university. I'm ex extremely disappointed, obviously, because it's going to mean more and more debt for students, which is obviously going to increase because um, £1 billion pounds isn't enough, which means it's going to go up and up. It is only the second reading, so there's still a fight yet, but it will be the middle-class students that are hit most. But what are the financial implications for universities? Variable fees will bring in an extra £1 billion pounds a year. Now, that should boost each university's income by between 5 and 10 per cent. But overall, they estimate they need £9 billion just to modernise their facilities. Most universities support variable fees, but top institutions say they must rise further still. We shall be pressing for a lifting of the cap, a freeing up of the market in higher education. So raising £3,000, should we say, to £5,000 or £6,000. That sort of uh, pressure is what we'd be putting on in the run-up to 2010. There'll be an election before these changes happen, and after the focus on poorer students, it may now shift to the effects on middle-income undergraduates who'll get the least financial aid. Hugh. Mike Baker there. The Sun newspaper claims tonight it has been told the conclusions of Lord Hatton's report into the death of Dr David Kelly. The report is to be published tomorrow lunchtime. Downing Street has tonight categorically denied having anything to do with any leak. The Sun maintains that the BBC will be reprimanded for the way it reported the government's use of intelligence in the run-up to war in Iraq. And it claims that the Prime Minister will be cleared of any blame. As far as uh, Tony Blair is concerned, he is cleared completely of any dishonourable conduct in the naming strategy for uh, Dr David Kelly. The Ministry of Defence is rebuked for the failing to let him know that his name might emerge or that it in fact had emerged but there were mitigating circumstances, they say, and that David Kelly himself was a difficult man to help and advise. Trevor Cavender of The Sun, Mullah correspondent Nick Hyam, has followed the Hutton inquiry from the start, is with me. Nick, Lord Hutton took very careful measures to make sure that this was kept under wraps until tomorrow when he publishes it. Um, one can only imagine his thoughts. Yes, I mean, everybody who has seen a copy in advance of the report, all the people involved, the government, the BBC, Dr Kelly's family and so on, has had to sign a confidentiality agreement. Um, this is exactly what Lord Hutton didn't want to happen. Somebody getting hold of all or some of his conclusions and putting their own spin on it before he had a chance to do it himself. What about the alleged conclusions as reported by The Sun? What do you make of them? Well, as Trevor Kavanagh, Trevor Kavanagh himself says, The Sun all along has put the worst possible construction, really, on all the evidence that Lord Hutton heard uh, from and about the BBC, and he's put the best possible... the papers put the best possible construction on everything about uh, Tony Blair, Alistair Campbell, and so on and so forth. Surprise, surprise, The Sun's version of his conclusions tomorrow is that Lord Hutton backs The Sun's view of what happened and who is to blame. I think you have to bear that in mind when reading tomorrow morning. Morning, son. Trevor Kavanagh tells me that he's not seen all the conclusions. As I understand it, he's had some of them read to him, and it may be that what we're getting is a version of Lord Hutton's views filtered through the sun's eyes. But we only have to wait until lunchtime tomorrow to find out the reality. Indeed. Nick, thank you very much. 
And uh, you can watch Lord Hutton delivering his findings at midday tomorrow in a special programme here on BBC One and on BBC News 24. Plans to build a major animal testing centre in Cambridge have been dropped because of safety concerns. Scientists had hoped to use the facility to try to find cures for brain diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. But the university says it can't afford to protect the site from animal rights activists. Palab Ghosh has more. There were once great plans for this Cambridge farm, but not anymore. This is where the multi-million pound world-leading Cambridge Primate Research Centre should have been built. Instead, it will remain an empty field. Part of the reason for that is that the university's funders wouldn't agree to a blank cheque to pay the huge ongoing costs of security. Construction costs soared, but there were real concerns about attacks from animal rights activists. I think if we throw in the additional security costs and the uncertainties of the running costs, in the face of protest, then that, as it were, um, tilted the balance, and I have to say that's, uh, that's probably the nail in the coffin. Shame on your existence! It's a repeat of these scenes that they're worried about. Three years ago, at nearby Huntingdon Life Sciences, cars were bombed and staff were attacked. But campaigners say that the real reason for the U-turn is that the science is out of date. The use of animals in research is a dying technology. That is the technology of the past. What's um, breaking um, ground in the future is things like brain scan scanning and the sophisticated non-animal techniques. Researchers, though, say that monkeys still need to be used. It's the only way, they say, to help the hundreds of thousands of people in Britain who suffer from brain diseases, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I do know the value of animal research because I deal daily with conditions that are currently untreatable, that cause a huge amount of suffering, not only to the patient, but all to their relatives. And we know we won't progress to any kinds of effective treatments until we have the answers coming from animal research. Tonight, the site lies empty. The university and its funders say that investment in primate research will continue. But after today, the question is whether they can avoid more defeats in the future. Palab Ghosh, BBC News, Cambridge. United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan says he's ready to send a mission to Iraq to assess whether elections can be held this summer. The Americans say they need a decision because of growing controversy about plans to transfer power to the Iraqi governing council without direct elections. In Iraq, six more American soldiers were killed in two bomb attacks today. Ben Brown reports now from Baghdad. A day of carnage in Iraq, six American troops killed in separate roadside bomb attacks and two staff from the American news network CNN shot dead. You might ask how, amidst all of this, could Iraqis go to the polls and vote for an interim government? Well, that's what the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan wants to find out. In Paris today, he announced he's sending a team to Iraq to see if elections this summer are possible. I hope they would also have the chance to talk to a large number of Iraqis and I really hope that their presence and their efforts will help the Iraqis to come to a consensus on how to take the transitional process forward. In Iraqi cities like Najaf, the majority Shiites have been agitating for one man, one vote elections without delay. There is a genuine thirst for democracy. The coalition government have said that we got rid of Saddam Hussein in, in, in order that uh, you have a, de a democratic Iraq. And, 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 and the democratic Iraq is what the, the coalition have said. So let, us, let it unfold, let us see it. I mean, I, now the Iraqi people are themselves asking, why is the coalition government afraid from democracy? Under Saddam, Iraqis did vote, but few dared oppose him. In this referendum two years ago, turnout was 100%, support for Saddam 100%. Now Iraqis want to vote for real. The United Nations will have to decide whether they think it is feasible to have free and fair elections here when the security situation is still so bad. But there's not much doubt what many ordinary Iraqis think. After years of Saddam's brutal dictatorship, they're impatient for democracy. Ben Brown, BBC News, Baghdad. 
The final part of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Return of the King, has topped this year's Oscar nominations. Got no less than, uh, no fewer than 11 nominations, including Best Film. From Los Angeles, Robert Nisbet reports. When the 76th Academy Awards are handed out here on Hollywood Boulevard later this year, they'll be remembered less for the artistic endeavour in front of the camera and more for the technical brilliance behind it. I'm pleased to announce that the films selected as the Best Picture nominees for 2003 are The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. In all, the final part of Peter Jackson's adaptation of Tolkien's work garnered 11 nominations, but none was for the acting. They were for achievements in editing, direction and visual effects. The trilogy cost $300 million to film. Many of the epic battle scenes were made possible by advances in computer technology. Peter Jackson's achievement has been to exploit that science. I think he's the first one who has really sort of gotten on top of him and really used that enormous bag of tricks and so on, and that's what he's being rewarded for. Computer programmers also helped create the Napoleonic confrontations in Master and Commander, which is up for 10 awards. Again, the performers were overlooked. Both fighter planes. The acting categories were dominated by performances in character-driven pieces, such as House of Sand and Fog, for which Sir Ben Kingsley received a nomination. He faces a challenge from fellow Briton Jude Law, as well as Sean Penn, Bill Murray and Johnny Depp. You're the only actor in the world who can't lie, Johnny, even for the sake of your kids. 26-year-old Samantha Morton, who grew up in Nottingham and cut her teeth on TV, is a Best Actress nominee for In America. And those nominees will find out whether they emerge from the Kodak Theatre here as winners when the envelopes are opened on the 29th of February. Robert Nisbet, BBC News, Hollywood. We'll be back a little later with the latest on the day's headlines. Now it's time to join our news teams across the UK. Bye for now. Good evening from BBC London News. A speed camera for every street in the capital. That's Ken Livingstone's latest plan to keep motorists sticking to the law. The announcement comes as traffic wardens are granted new powers to hand out £100 on-the-spot fines for driving offences. But many are opposed to the scheme, which is part of a new push to give local authorities more power on the roads. Sarah Harris has this report. <laughs> of traffic law in the capital is about to change. For traffic wardens in London, new powers. After a change in the law last month, they will be able to give out £100 fines for traffic offences. This won't improve their standing with motorists. It's bad enough doing your job up here as it is without, you know, getting caught. You just get moved on, it's ridiculous. I find the traffic wardens not up to scratch. They're not, not going to be up to scratch to, uh, to do that. We need police officers only to do that sort of thing. Don't like traffic wardens anyway, so yeah, I think it is a bad idea. A £100 fines will also be sent out by local authorities for offences filmed on cameras. They include waiting on box junctions, turning right or left in no right or left turn areas, blocking paths and roads, and £500 fines for lorries in restricted areas. Motoring organisations don't agree. It will help cut congestion. The AA is opposed to the idea that local authorities are taking on the enforcement of these offences because drivers are already suspicious that it's more about raising revenue and not about enforcing the law fairly. So we're against the idea. But local authorities say selfish motorists who clog the streets should be fined by them, not just the police. Well, it's not fundraising. Remember, only those who break the law pay the fine. And this, all the money raised by the fines will go directly back into transport spending, into off-street car parks, improving roads and pavements, work against congestion and in, in favour of road safety. In the elementary stages, the new laws will go on trial in Ealing, Camden, Croydon, Newham, Wandsworth and Hammersmith. The budget airline Ryanair says its cheap fares are being threatened by the European Commission, who are looking into subsidies the company received from Brussels' Charleroi Airport. The firm believes it will be told to repay millions of pounds which could threaten its routes across Europe. Ryanair officials say they were also told they would no longer be able to receive similar subsidies from other airports. The Muslim cleric Abu Qatada's appeal against his detention under the Anti-Terrorism Act has been dismissed. 
London-based Katada has been detained since October 2002 at Belmarsh Prison. He's been described by the Home Office as one of the most significant of the radical clerics. Police are trying to trace the mother of a baby abandoned at Heathrow Airport. The boy is about two weeks old and was found in a disabled toilet in Terminal 2 on Friday. No note was left, but CCTV footage from the airport has identified two people of oriental appearance who were close by at the time. Anyone who lives in London has more than 100 radio stations to choose from, but the latest one comes with a twist. It's broadcast from Wandsworth Prison, the first jail-based station in the country. Radio 10999 AM is broadcast from behind bars. The aim? To encourage inmates to get back into mainstream education and hopefully stop them from re-offending. Do you see that as something that can remedy the problems that we're having with violent crime? Yeah, I think one thing we have to be Giving clear Giving the prisons minister a grilling. The interview very, very by an basis. inmate kicked off uh, the launch of Radio 10 in Wandsworth prison. prison. The radio station, broadcast on 999 AM, is being run by prisoners for the prison community. For those involved in running the station, it's a really important opportunity to develop some skills, get some qualifications, build up some confidence, and then maybe, once they're released, to, to use those new skills in a very constructive way in the community. You were on TV at lunchtime. Oh, show my best BBC. For the prisoners, it's not just about being recognised by Cherie Blair, who was there to show her support. This could be the, the, the turning point in my life. You know, it, this is going to go on for six months. So in six months' time, I could have achieved so much. You know, and my attitude and my, my, my views towards life and how I want to live my life could have, will change, you know. And any change I make will only be good for my family and my children. There are around 1,400 inmates here at Wandsworth Prison. Around 500 of them are on remand, which means they're waiting to be tried. So the radio station really wants to make sure they cater for those who might be here just for a few days and those who are actually serving lengthy prison sentences. Tune in to Radio 1. It'll offer advice on accessing prison services and adjusting to life in the outside world. So what do the listeners make of it? I believe it's a good idea, yeah. But um, I still believe that it would have been a better idea if it were to be broadcasted um, other places rather than just, just the prison. Although you can only tune in within the prison walls, some material will be swapped with outside radio stations, including BBC London 94.9. If Radio 1 is a success, similar projects could be set up in prisons across the country. Samantha Simmons, BBC London News, at Wandsworth Prison. A key stage of the £5 billion Channel Tunnel rail link was completed today. 17 months after work first began, a tunnel boring machine surfaced near St Pancras, linking North London with Stratford. The high-speed link is due to be completed by 2007. Well, now a look at the weather forecast with Peter. Thanks very much. The windy, wintry weather not far away now. I think it'll be uh, towards dawn that the first of the snow arrives and then we'll get some more later in the day tomorrow. There will be some brightness in between, though, uh, in between the snow showers. Most of the snow, I think, is likely to be in the east and it will feel bitterly cold. That's the forecast. Well, if it does snow overnight, you'll need to know the latest travel situation, so tune in from 6.30 when Gillian and Kate will tell you all you need to know. Now it's back to Hugh, but from all of us, good night. Main news tonight, Tony Blair's parliamentary majority has been reduced to just five this evening as MPs voted on plans for higher university fees in England. It's the biggest rebellion Mr Blair has suffered on domestic policy since he came to power. Bill's opponents have said the fight isn't over yet. And the Sun newspaper says it's been told some of the conclusions of Lord Hutton's report into the death of Dr David Kelly to be published tomorrow. The paper says the BBC will be reprimanded, the Prime Minister cleared of blame. News nights getting underway over on BBC Two. They'll be talking to the Education Secretary Charles Clark about the tuition fees. But from all of us here on the 10 o'clock team, good night.